staff of the RAF were on the move again. In all the African ports, Bizerta, Tunis, Sousse, Sfax, and in Malta and Sicily too, we were embarking. Everywhere there were whacking great landing craft with lorries and blokes pouring into them. going from Africa to Europe and going there in a big way. And the RAF was on the move in the air too. The tactical and strategic bombers were out in strength. Every day we were flying up the volcano run, past Etna, past Stromboli, and all the way up to Vesuvius. And why? Because the Fifth Army had landed in Italy at Salerno, and they were finding the going very tough. Jerry had chucked in everything he'd got, so every day we were there too, British, Americans, Canadians, Australians and New Zealanders, in Baltimore's, Boston's and Mitchell's, putting in attack after attack on Jerry's troops, artillery positions and communications. It was a long way out to the battlefront and back to base. The bombers could make it, but the fighters couldn't. A forward fighter airfield was badly needed. Left standard rudder, left standard rudder. By midday, the stuff for the fighter squadrons was on its way. But landing craft are not Baltimore's or Boston's. They take a little longer. Easy rudder, easy rudder. You'd think they'd give us something a bit special to eat for such a big occasion, but they didn't. Same old meat and veg stew. Good job the sea was calm. Even then, some of us couldn't take it. Hey, George, how about some for me? I think you're the only one working around here. Come on. We're just about going. Crafty pint and the cricketers eventually now. Friendly aircraft approaching on the port quarter. But though we weren't doing much, the bombers were droning over all day. All day and for 17 days. At least 18 bombers in every formation. So the targets were getting a lot of dirt, and from a very great height. Salerno, we could see the position for ourselves. The Allies held the beaches, but not much more. In fact, they held so little that as we came ashore, we could hear the guns hard at it. Now it was our turn. 
On that precious little strip of land, we had to set up a fighter airfield, and that's no small order. Let's say we've got three squadrons. That's 48 fighters. To start with, those 48 fighters need 200 tons of equipment. Then to carry all this, they need 250 motor vehicles. Some of ours have come straight from the Western Desert and still have their Arabic numbers on. Then there's the daily bill, petrol. In one day, these fighters use up 7,500 gallons, enough to drive my old car seven times round the world, in one day, mark you. Then there's ammunition. Nine tons of it goes up the spout every day. Then wherever we go, defense goes, barrage balloons. Okay, so we got all the stuff, but we hadn't an airfield yet. So we brought along tons of construction gear, bulldozers, scrapers, graders and levelers. Out they came, and before we had time to get sand in our boots, there they were hacking out an airfield. Mind you, it wasn't a super job with concrete runways, a control tower and a cinema. <laughs> no, sir. There wasn't time to do anything but scrape out a flat strip. Because just up there, the army was getting a pretty rough time. In fact, our guns were firing from behind us, and we were banging the way of the enemy's answers. Twenty-four hours after we landed, we had something for our aircraft to put down on. Nowadays, fighters work right alongside the advancing army, ground strafing and bombing enemy positions, busting tanks and shooting up enemy transport. They're kind of super artillery, so we had to get them into the battle, good and fast. We all piled in, British, Americans, servicing commandos, all a lot of us, rearming, bombing up, refueling, getting everything on the top line. And before their engines had time to cool off, our fighters went into action. established a frontline air base, just the way Sir Arthur Teller showed us. We shan't forget what he taught us when it comes to doing it again, somewhere in Northern Europe. 